Welcome back to ChipReport.tv. I'm Chris Gamble of Chris Gamble's Analog Life and the Amp Hour Podcast. This is episode four, and this week is going to be a little impractical. I'm going to be completely honest. Uh, <laughs> some of the parts that came out this week are, I, I'm not sure. I, you could definitely tell that they're targeting the green market, which is still high margin in some places. Not necessarily everywhere. I mean, China, which is making a lot of the solar panels and inverters and stuff, definitely has a high margin. So. I'm not really sure where they're coming from, but the reason I like these parts this week is because they're kind of a sign of things to come. And you'll get what I, you'll see what I'm getting at later. One other thing, I am off teleprompter this week. Uh, <laughs> didn't really work in the past, so why not just go for it, right? You might see a sheet of paper here and there, only because reading data sheets and reading product announcements, these part numbers just absolutely suck. So let's get started. All right, first up, NCP 1851 FCC T1G. Seriously, guys, come on. Let's try and shorten up these part numbers a little bit. Even if you just went to numbers, it'd be helpful, right? Anyways, it's from On Semiconductor. It is a battery management chip. Now, here's the thing. This is still just a product announcement, and that's take it as you want to because a product announcement isn't a data sheet, it isn't silicon on the line, it's just a, hey, this is what's coming out, so keep an eye out for it. Uh, but it is a cool thing, it's a sign of things to come, and that's what I liked about it. There's a really great diagram which we'll show here. And this actually shows the entire circuit and what it's going to be doing. Basically, you can have multiple power sources input, and it's got a converter, a DC to DC converter in there, so it can handle a range of voltages, and then it can also monitor and charge a battery and power your application at the same time. All pretty important things if you're doing portable power. So you can have a USB plug input, right? Five volts on a USB connector. Or you could have a you know six volt, five to six to seven volt input AC to DC converter, like the wall work plugs that everybody's used to. Or you could have a backup power source, so maybe a second USB cable, firewire, or anything else that could supply power. All in all though, this eventually just allows you to power your product and when you have extra charge to control your battery. What else does it have? Uh, not only does it allow you to switch over easily, it also has I, I squared C control, so pretty standard these days, you know, two to three wire depending on what you're doing. Um, but it also has a temperature sensor, so that's great. So if you, especially when you're using batteries because batteries chemistries can be pretty temp temperature sensitive, you can actually tell how when you might need to supply more power or you know back it off or just completely shut down and especially if you're you know getting towards the top of your charge cycle but uh okay and sorry uh no teleprompter like i said <laughs> um there's a state machine in there as well so we talked about state machines in episode two or three or something like that and the state machine basically is what's going to allow you to switch between uh, trickle charge and charge dump mode for like basically it, it ch changes between a current, a current source and a voltage source. And that's all going to depend on the battery type you're using. In this case, it's meant for lithium ion. Basically, it's going to monitor your voltages for you and your currents and power it how it needs to be powered. That's the nice thing about it. Okay, here's the bad side though. This is a flip chip. Do you know what a flip chip is? Flip chip is when basically it's just silicon. And sometimes there's packaging around it, but I don't think it is in this case. I think in this case it's just meant to be a bare die. In the event it is a flip chip type where there's, uh, you know, ball grids on the top and you just flip it over, that would be okay. But I don't think there's enough details. So what I did instead is I found other similar parts for you. I think that's kind of valuable. So right now there is the LTC 40, 4002 from Linear Technology. There's the UCC 3956 from TI, which is actually Unitro, that UCC, you can tell there. And Maxim has this Max 1737. And basically these are all just different process nodes. You know, they're, they're different levels of integration. They're not gonna all have the state machine and the temperature sensor and everything integrated because those are the things that get added throughout the generations as, as the products get better and better. So you're not gonna get everything in there, but it might allow you to get this right now, if you're, especially if you're like, oh, I have a project where I need a battery charger and I need to supply power to the, project, uh, to the, to the rest of the circuit as well at the same time. So those are the kind of cool parts you might wanna check out if you need it right now. Next up is the MMIX1F44N100Q3. Seriously? 
Come on, guys. It's a MOSFET. Okay, pretty simple. And it's from Ixis? I X Y S? <laughs> Ixis. Ixis? <laughs> We'll go with Ixus. Uh, <laughs> I hate that. I'm sorry. Uh, but they are a growing company. Not, not growing. I mean, they're listed. They're listed on the stock exchange. Uh, and they own Claire Semiconductor. They're, you know, a lot of passives. They own a couple other companies as well. And, and, and they make really good parts. They really do. They make some hard to find type of MOSFETs, you know, P-type, uh, enhancement mode, all these kind of crazy ones. But they have a new part, and it's meant for uh, automotive, power, clean tech, like I said, green, green. What does it do? It's a MOSFET. <laughs> uh, basically, it's single, single MOSFET, end channel type, enhancement mode. So this is gonna be good in all your, you know, your DC to DC, really high power, DC to DC kind of converters, uh, lighting, uh, LED control, chargers, motors, basically everything you need to do that's high powered and fast. So, it can accept a change of 50 volts per nanosecond or 50,000 volts per microsecond in terms of like slew rate and turning on. It also has an electrically isolated tab, which is pretty standard these days. I mean, you don't always get the tab isolated. Sometimes it's grounded, but that depends on the package as well. And this package is surface mount. <laughs> 33 millimeter by 25 millimeter by 5 millimeter. So, you know, it's it's not a TO, uh, was it 294? TO 92? No, 92 is tiny. Uh, TO 220 is the one with the metal hangy thing. That's like the LM317. It's surface mount. <laughs> but basically, this is gonna allow you to power really big stuff. Uh, let's go over some of the power specs. <laughs> VDS, one kilovolt. <laughs> I, what is ID 25? At 25 volts on the gate, the, I, the drain volt, the drain current is gonna be 30 amps. And so the total power is 694 watts. Wow. So what's special about this thing? Well, you could say the price. <laughs> uh, yeah, for a hundred of them, you're gonna pay about $31 a piece. And for a thousand of them, $26 a piece. So this is definitely a specialty part. But what this means is we're getting more enhancement mode FETs on the market. But now they're available in high power. And if you need them, you're going to pay for them. Ixis for all your product needs in FETs and such. For the record, this is all after work. This is like 10 p.m. It's cool. Next up is the KT24-1A-40L-SMD. This is by Meter Electronics, or METER, M-E-D-E-R. But basically, this is a read relay. And so, just like the last, whoa. <laughs> just like the last FET was super high power, this is actually meant for high power applications as well. Read relays can hold off tons of voltage, they have really low leakage currents, and they can pass a decent amount of current. In this case, it's a one kilovolt part, and it can pass an amp, so you're not gonna be doing the same thing at a, at a time, right? You can't, if you're passing an amp, you're probably not doing so at a thousand volts, but basically this can do, you know, either or. You know, in a switch mode, it passes an amp. If it's off, it can hold off a thousand amps. So this could also fit in your green tech applications. So probably not in a car, but maybe like an inverter. If you need to switch in power, that's the good kind of thing. And that's actually what they're talking about. What about read relays? Do you know what those are? Read relays are basically, you have a big read, maybe like this, and then you have a coil over here, and this is a piece of metal, and this is a piece of metal, and you power the thing up here and it goes, and it closes the contact. What's great about it is when it's like this, when it's like this, there's a lot of gap in between it. And there's really great videos actually by Meter and a couple others out there about the, the manufacture of read relays. It's a really complicated and interesting process. So I really highly suggest it. I'll try and put it in the show notes, shipreport.tv. That's a site. Did you know it's a site? All right. To power it, you need 24 volts on the coil, which is pretty standard for relays. And it's kind of an industrial, uh, industrial voltage, right? It's a, uh, 24 volts, you're gonna get that from a lot of standard power supplies. You're gonna see that in a lot of industrial systems. So, 
you power this thing with 24 volts digitally, you close the contact, you power the, the coil, you snap the reed together, and a thousand volts now becomes an amp and it flows on through to your inverter or whatever else you want it for. Coil resistance is only two ohms, so that's the 24 volts when it goes across it. It's only gonna be two ohms, so you're not gonna be passing a whole crap load of current through there. Wait, yes you are. <laughs> two ohms. Um, B equals I R. You should probably current limit it. <laughs> it's a good draw up to 12 amps. Yeah, current limit your digital outputs. And the contact itself, so when you actually snap that reed together, it's less than 200 milliohms. So on a one amp passing through it, that's only gonna be a 0.2 volt voltage that develops across the, re the reed itself, which is good. You don't wanna you know, lose, lose a lot of voltage there. The reed itself can handle up to 100 watts. So at, a at one amp, you can do up to 100 volts. And more than that, you're probably gonna start you know, heating it up, basically. That's really when you start breaking things down and creating bad contacts and all this other stuff. And the other nice thing is when it's off, this is a new product line. This is the KT product line. They actually had a previous product line and the KT product line can now go from, it used to be four kilovolts, now it's up to eight kilovolts. So when it's off, it's really off. You can really stand off quite a lot. Uh, not just the thousand volts, but also this is like insulation resistance and yada yada yada. So that's the improvement. The package itself is a 30 by 10 millimeter package. It's about, eh, they look like about six or seven millimeters high. It's actually quite high off the board. This actually looks like a conversion from a through hole part where they just kind of bent the legs out a little bit and now you can put on pads on your board. Again, this is not gonna be cheap. It's, sorry, this is not a cheap week. I'm not sure why it all came up at the same time, but this is good for green tech and they wanna make money on it and you know, yeah. So, uh, but it's, it's, a, it's a good sign because more read relays on the market means that eventually the price will go down, right? Supply and demand and this, this whole thing, right? So, check it out. Last up is one that's, is a chip that's a little bit more accessible, I hope. It's a, reasonable price and you can maybe even solder it by hand and it might not blow up on you. Not the other ones would, I'm just saying that this this is one you may have seen before or maybe not. It's the ICE40 from Lattice Semiconductor. This is a, FP, an, a FPGA or Field Programmable Gate Array. And these are everywhere these days. Um, you know, you'll see them in anything you need to reconfigure logic wise. You can actually embed soft processors into them. You can buy off the shelf IP for DDR controllers and Mac controllers and everything that's in you know, your off the shelf ARM chip, you can actually put into an FPGA and customize. And they're getting really, really quite advanced. I mean, they've, they've always been advanced, but they're getting even more advanced. So have you heard about this chip? I hadn't and maybe you had neither because Lattice is kind of number four, um, at least in my opinion. Uh, Xilinx, Altera, Actel, slash Microsemi. Uh, those are kind of the top three as far as I can tell, and Lattice is number four, I, I think. Maybe I'm wrong. But this is a new, a new family from them. They say it's 80% more power efficient than their last family. It's on the 40 nanometer node, which is very well known now. They're kind of pushing 28 nanometers now. You'll get some back-end fabs that are doing 65 nanometers, but even analog is getting into 90 nanometers and 65 nanometers. And once analog is there, it's pretty much uh, pretty well proven and boring by that point. And that's when all the analog fun happens. So uh, from a digital perspective, this isn't leading edge or anything. And it's not, uh, it's not gonna be top of the pack, right? But what's, what's good about it is they're targeting it as low cost. Now, low cost for an FPGA is a lot different than low cost for a micro, microcontroller. You can get 32-bit microcontrollers these days for less than a dollar. I think some of them are even pushing down into the 50 cent range. FPGAs, on the other hand, are pretty solidly at still above the three or four dollar mark unless you're doing super, super tiny. Now, this isn't a huge FPGA, it's got uh, about 8,000 logic cells, but at the same time, uh, that's not small either. You could you could fit a, a processor in there. If you wanted to embed a, a soft core processor in there, you could very easily do that. 
Now, the other thing to note about this is this is still using a four, a f uh, four input lookup table. And a lot of the newer devices, I know the Spartan 6 from Xilinx and a couple others, they're using six input lookup tables and they, they play games. Some of the older stuff, like the Actel Pro ASIC parts, those are three input lookup tables. And what does that mean for you? It means to store values, if you have more values, you need to use more lookup tables, basically. So some of the newer parts are more efficient at storing the values and some of the older ones, you know, you have to actually take up more space. So take it however you want to. Basically, they're targeting this for low cost. Uh, they have packages that are available for hobbyists. Fancy that. They have flat packs. They have no lead flat packs, which are not really that friendly. And they have the standard 256 ball grid arrays and a whole range of different products. So what else is good about this thing? Uh, they give you the development environment for Linux or Windows, no Mac, so sorry you Apple fans out there. But you might be able to you know, do a boot Linux or Windows or whatever else you want to do. And you know it's got built-in PLLs and a lot of the standard stuff that's in FPGAs these days. I found out about this because of the development kit that came across my desk, and I actually didn't know about this this part before that. It's actually uh, it's been out since March apparently, but I hadn't heard anything. But again, I wasn't really paying attention. So uh, it has a development kit. It's pretty decently priced, and I'll link it in the show notes. So what can we build this week? Let's see what we have. We have a battery controller. We have a high power MOSFET, we have a read relay switch, and we have a low power, low cost FPGA. So what can we do here? Well, I'm gonna call it a solar stacker. What the heck does that mean? <laughs> so first off, let's take the battery charger and we're actually gonna make a mobile, or in this case, floating device, which means it doesn't have a ground. And why do you want it to be floating? Well, if you wanna stack up solar cells, you're actually gonna be adding their voltages together, the voltages and currents. And you need to be able to monitor them dynamically. So we're gonna have a, a battery powered device that monitors <laughs> a solar panel, right? And you're gonna have a sense resistor in, in the path, basically, to help monitor it. And you're gonna be controlling it with your FPGA, so it's nice and programmable for all those mistakes that everybody makes every time, just like me. And, okay, so, we know that we are at peak power for a certain sunlight, right? We're monitoring across the, the solar panel and it's stacked on top of another solar panel. And we know at this certain voltage and current, we want to switch it in to the rest of the stack. We do so with our high powered MOSFET. And when we want to turn it off completely, we turn off the read relay that's in line with it. Boom. It's out of the circuit. So I'm gonna call that the solar stacker. I kind of made that up. <laughs> I'm not sure if it works, just like all these other ones, but it integrates all of the parts from this week's Chip Report TV. So that's all for this week, episode four of chipreport.tv. Sorry about making stuff up. <laughs> no, not really, I'm, I'm okay with it. We will be back next week with more parts. I've already got a bunch on my list for next week and hopefully a little bit closer to episode four than this one was to episode three. In the meantime, please give us a like on YouTube, thumbs up, or whatever they're calling it these days. And you can subscribe on YouTube by clicking here. Or you can subscribe on chipreport.tv and find the RSS feed. You can also leave comments at chipreport.tv. Send me an email anytime at chris at chipreport.tv. Until next time, we'll see you later.